everyone, and welcome to the MTAC More Than a Classroom podcast with Mr. B. I apologize for our one-week hiatus, so let me explain myself. I know that we're trying to release every morning or every uh, Monday morning at 6. However, last week, pod- podcast was recorded. Everything was good to go on my end, recording-wise, and the file just completely corrupted. That's the first time it's happened to me, so... Um, I use a website called Riverside, and for whatever reason, anytime I tried to download it, it just didn't work. It just sat there, and it's kind of the the spinny wheel of death, if you will. So I'm going to try to get back and record that. I had a guest lined up anyway for that, and then they ended up having to back out and reschedule. So if you were really looking forward to that episode on friendships, relationships in general, that is going to come back, I promise. Um, But... I wanted to get a, a, a guest on here that I think will speak really well to that. It's actually a former student of mine, so it will be a little trip down memory lane. Of, and, and it's actually a student who their eighth grade year was my first year teaching. And so they got to see <laughs> me grow just as much as I got to see all of my students grow. So it's super cool now that uh, she's off in college and, you know, it, it is a real, real adult right? It's so funny that when we think of our students, a lot of us teachers, at least me, I always think of students as who they were and how they looked and how they acted the first time that I have them. So if I have them in sixth grade in the Broadway program at my school, I always think of them as whatever that first Broadway role was that they had or the first time that they auditioned for a solo and chorus or whatever it is. So it's just always funny when I um when I get to see them all grown up and just doing great things. I think there's nothing better for teachers than to see uh, see their students all grown up, just prospering, doing well. That's all we want, right? So today I decided that instead of going with one of our um one one of my ideas that I had written down before I started the pod, I'm gonna do something that's a little <laughs> right on the nose for what we've been dealing with here over the first week or two um, in Florida specifically. Maybe some of you guys have heard about the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Maybe you haven't, but I wanted to bring to light a couple things. You're, you're going to notice that this is you know all about legislation, particularly in Florida where I teach and the war on education. I know a lot of you're like, there is no war on education, but specifically thinking about public education, there's a lot of things that point to a bit of a war between government towards education, which is funny because it's a government funded thing, right? So, and, you know, parents, students, everybody just looking down on education as a whole. So I wanted to touch on a couple things and it's going to be me ranting a little bit, but I'm going to try to keep that to a minimum, right? Especially uh, when we're coming up with solutions and things like that, you know me, I I don't want to just sit here and make it a giant complainer fest the entire time as a lot of people tend to do. So legislation has been playing a really, really big role in the first couple of weeks here in Florida. There's two major bills that have gone through. They're part of the same system that all went through right around the same time. And it's really made the classroom different. I'm not going to say it's more difficult or less difficult, but it is definitely different. And this legislation dropped the week before school. Like everything went into place the week before school started. And we are still feeling the repercussions. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit as we get into it. So the first one I want to talk about is the, there's a, a new cell phone policy with Florida schools. And what the legislation states, what the, what the bill states is that there are to be no cell phones visible. So that means they have to be away, away, not sitting on your desk, even if it's face down, not charging on a table in the corner, like away during um, instructional time. Now, each county is allowed to define, from what I've seen, different counties here in Florida are doing different things as far as the definition and how they're going to institute this. I know that with my county that I teach in, we are saying that instructional time is any time you are in a class. And it can be a class or a club time. We have club time at our school as well. 
any time that you are in a classroom, it's instructional time. And the only time students are allowed to use their phone at all is when the teacher specifically gives permission for the students to take their phone or electronic devices. I'm going to say phone, but it's for all electronic devices. So students to take their phones or electronic devices out and use them specifically for a purpose that the teacher says. Now, in years past, like my cell phone role in my class has always been it's a way unless I tell you that you can use it. Now we have block periods during our our uh, school day. So classes are about an hour and a half long during four of the five days of the week. And for me, teaching chorus and musical theater, it's a very active class. And so singing an hour and a half straight is very strenuous on the voice, not just for the students, but for me as well, if I'm doing that back to back to back, right? So coming up with some kind of activity in the middle of class to let them rest their voice, but also stay in the learning process is something that I really have to do this year. I can no longer just say, all right, you know what? If you guys work really hard for the first 40 minutes of class, I'm going to give you a 10, 15 minute, I call it my brain dump period. If you want to be on your phones, watch a YouTube video, watch some TikToks, whatever it may be, play a game. Uh, this is the time that we are going to start that break. This is the time you need to be back in your seats. And I hold them to that. And if they're not able to follow that, then they get less of a break the next time. It's a bit of a trade off. And I like to treat my students just like adults. You know, it's just like work. If you know that you have an hour for lunch and you consistently are taking an hour 15, an hour 20 for lunch, your bosses are probably going to start getting a lot more assertive with getting you back on time, right? So if the students are good and get back into their seats, then all's well that ends well. And my rule is always just don't take any pictures or videos and don't play any sound out of your phone because it gets hectic. Um, I, I can no longer do any of that in my classroom. They can't even be on their phones for a break no matter how good they were. When they are in my class, it is considered instructional time. And so I've been looking into finding some videos the kids can watch, getting some board games. I already have chess boards in my room if they want to play chess in the middle, but I'm just weary about letting them go, especially in the big classes of 60 plus students, right? There aren't enough board game spaces in my room to let all 60 kids break into groups of four and play some board games for 10 or 15 minutes. And there aren't a lot of games that can be played in 10 or 15 minutes. So I don't know if it's going to be dex cards or whatever. Now, the parents and students have had some major backlash to this rule. Number one being the parents say that their students need their cell phone in case of emergencies, which totally understandable, right? If a code red is called and your student is potentially in danger, you being able to reach out to them as a parent, I, I get it. However, if every parent and student are trying to call each other or text each other. And maybe you're doing all of that over Wi-Fi, and all of a sudden the school system can't be triggered and sent out efficiently to all of the teachers. That way we know what to do and sent the information sent home to all the parents. That way they know what's going on. The students having their own phone can actually be more of a, de uh, a detriment to us in that situation. We also are, are using that excuse. Most of the parents that are saying that, I agree, your students need it for their safety. And the parents that are training, not training their kids, but teaching their kids to only use their cell phone in those specific times, that would be fine. But we know that not every parent-student relationship is like that, right? There's going to be kids that your parent tells you this is for emergencies only, but they don't know how to set up any sort of um, where your phone is blocked from being used during these hours of the day or from going on these apps. And so you tell your you tell your mom, you know, I, I really need my phone. I really need it for emergencies. And then you're just sitting on YouTube all day, burning your battery, playing whatever game, Crossy Road and angry birds 97 or however many they're on now right so parents we have to remember that the students might tell you that they're only using it for something but in reality they're they're using their phone for other things most of the students are and i can't tell you in my seven years of teaching how many students i'm like hey please put your phone away 
You're not supposed to have it out. And they go, oh, I'm texting my mom or I'm texting my dad or I'm texting whoever, insert family member. And I say, okay, well, will you tell them that they should not be texting you during class? Or, you know, oh, well, then can I see your text message to them? And the answer is always, oh, you know, roll, I roll, put their phone away because they're just texting their friends. And so that makes it really difficult on us as teachers. I know that not every kid is the same, but the vast majority are not doing what they're supposed to be doing on their phone. So I kind of like the rule change, but I wouldn't be against parents being able to write notes for their kids specifically saying they can have it in their pocket, but maybe that there is some sort of immediate discipline for students if they start taking it out of their pocket and if the parents sign it knowing, hey, this is going to be more easily accessible for my kid and they're going to be more prone to getting in trouble for it. The second big piece of legislation that went through right around the same time was the the nickname law, as people are, are calling it. Now, legislation cannot discriminate against a certain type of person, right? Now, we all know that a lot of the, well, maybe you don't know, a lot of the parents, particularly in Florida, don't like the fact that their kids wanted to go by a different name at school than what they were going by at home. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're talking about those students that maybe they want a gender neutral name because they're not happy with their name. Maybe they don't feel comfortable coming out to their parents yet. So if Alex wants to be Alice and I guess Alex is already a gender neutral name, but you, if Adam wants to be Alice, right? In years past, that student just asked, that student comes up to me and they say, Hey, I prefer to go by Alice. And I go, okay, cool. I'll call you Alice. And that's it. That's the end of it. I call that student by Alice unless they ask to be called something else. And it's fine. We go about our day. This is something where the parents feel like the teachers are trying to indoctrinate the kids. I'm going to use that word a couple times in this. It, it, blows my mind that they think this is happening, but you know, they're trying that the teachers are trying to push a certain agenda on the students and that the parents deserve to know what their kids are being called at school. Now I can see both sides, right? We want to know everything that's going on with our child. I get it. However, if we take a step back and think about the fact that your child wants to feel comfortable with themselves at school, and is comfortable enough asking their friends and teachers and ad administrators at the school to call them by a different name, but they're too afraid to tell you, whether it's because of the disappointment or they're not sure how you're going to react. I think that we need to make sure we do a good job at home of having that conversation. Now, if you had that conversation at home with your child and you still don't agree with it and you still don't want them to call you something – that's where we get into this this nickname rule, right? So I can I I have to call you by your full legal name. We can't or by something that's a part of your legal name. So if your name is Adam James Smith, right? I could call you by your last name, Smith, I could call you Adam, I could call you James. I can if your name now now this is where it is really hilarious because if your name is Nicholas, I cannot call you Nick. Your legal name is Nicholas. I cannot call you Chris. Your name is Christopher, unless your name is Chris legally, right? And so, you know, if your name is Alexis, I cannot call you Allie because you've been Allie. If your name, you get my point, right? So the parents are now saying that it's the school that is taking the law too far and well you know what the law was meant for yes we do know what the law was meant for right however we can't just discriminate we can't say oh we'll call your kid by what they want to be called as long as it fits the gender that they were assigned at birth if you put that if you tried to get that passed as a bill it would get shut down immediately because you are blatantly discriminating against the trans community right and so there are just LGBTQ plus community in general. 
So this has been a constant fight. I have a couple students this year that I've been calling them one name for two years and their parents don't want them to be called by that, even if it's just something as simple as a nickname, just shortened parts of their name because they want their kid to be called Christopher in full. They don't want him to be called Chris. That's what we have to call them as teachers and it's hard. And some students, a lot of teachers have been calling them by just last names, but it be, it becomes really difficult. Um, especially when my objective is just to teach. This is not the first time that legislation, rules, state mandates, things like that have come into play and just turned the education world upside down. I, if you are a teacher or a parent or a student that went through the COVID year, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Everywhere around the country, different states and counties and things were doing different stuff with mask mandates and uh, social distancing and all of these buzzwords that we had to do, right? A lot of teachers had tape, you know, around. It was a scary time when it was unknown. We didn't know what was going on. Then we, when the vaccine came out and some parents wanted their kids to get vaccinated and some didn't. And then I can't even remember what the age was, but there was a certain age where students, even though they were minors, were allowed to go get the vaccine on their own. They didn't need a parent to sign over for it. It was so, so odd. And there were so many different factors going into it. Um, and, and Florida was a really popular place for people to talk about. I know that my family up in Maine, because Florida opened back up so quickly and basically said, you know, COVID's not real. Let's open the whole thing back up and we're good. And so I had my classes were split right down the middle. The county where I teach is split right down the middle, which I like, by the way. I don't I don't want everyone to be like minded. I think that that leads to complacency. I like having students with vastly differing views, um, talking to each other, doing projects with each other, making friendships with each other, because there's no reason why people on opposite ends of the spectrum politically can't get along on, on a human level. I firmly believe that. So uh, sometimes rules just come by and, and students and parents might have an issue with it. I mean, I, I had parents screaming at me because for our Broadway, for our musical that year, we were, we wanted to have our musical, but if students were going to be within the enclosed space, we still had to follow all of the rules. And so it was either we have kids practice mask off, but be completely outside and outside in Florida is just going to be terrible. And we can't perform outside, right? It was either we do that or we perform inside, but then we have to take a break every 30 minutes and let the kids sit outside or we just have, we just have masks. And so we built masks. We made masks for them. My now wife cut fabric and made masks with elastic that matched all the costumes and then, and it ended up not even it, – it wasn't even bad. It was something that the audience members said, ah, oh, you know what? It was kind of weird to see at first, but after the first couple scenes, no one really cared. And the kids still got an experience of being in the musical. It was better than canceling the entire thing. So the the next rule that is different county basis and how it's enforced, especially at different levels, middle to high school specifically, are, are dress codes. This is a really hot topic with everybody. I know that our county, the dress code is actually made by students. They generally, every couple of years, they'll have a panel of students, high school students that will look at the current dress code and alter it as needed. Me being a male teacher, it's really hard for me to dress code female students, mainly because all it takes is one female student to say, you know, my teacher looked, you know, why are you looking at me that way, right? If you're wearing a low cut shirt and I'm like, hey, that's against dress code, you know, do you have a jack you can throw or whatever? All it takes is one accusation for me to be in some giant storm. And so a lot of times if I have female students that are um, falling under that dress code discipline, I'll call up a a female teacher um, that I'm close with and say, Hey, can you have a talk with them? Or maybe I have a TA that's older. That's a female that can sit down with them and just talk to them. But that's really it. Now with male students, you know, I'm 
I'm going to tell them like, hey, it, the big thing with with the boys is just pulling your pants up. I should not be seeing your underwear, right? That's just like pull it up, man. Wear a belt. I have a whole bin of uh of like cowboy belts in the costume room in my room that I have given to students over the year years and been like, listen, you need a belt. Here's a belt. I better see you wearing this belt every day. So that that's always funny. It, it's funny until the kids turn it around, you know, like the girls, uh, you know, they'll get like the cowgirl belts and they'll be like, this is kind of cute. I'm like, no, it's not the point. <laughs> I just want you to stop pulling your pants up, doing the little like hop up where you get to like pull your pants up. That's always funny. That was the, uh, in show choir. God, it must've been five, six years ago. Um, we were practicing and this was when show choir, there weren't enough boys in my program at the time to have boys in show choir. So it was just a SSA soprano, soprano alto group. And they like, when we were practicing choreography, they just kept, there was like seven or eight of them out of the 25 that just kept messing with their clothing, like pulling the shirts down, you know, like tugging them down at the waistline or like doing the little hop, pulling the pants up because pants kept falling down on them. And I stopped it after one of them. I was like, y'all, if you don't like stop messing with your clothes all that much, especially like pulling the pants up, I'm going to go grab the belts. <laughs> so naturally phrasing, they're thinking, I'm going to go grab the belts. <laughs> no. And they were like, what? <laughs> and they started laughing because they understood the mistake right away. And I was like, no, the bin of belts to wear belts. So that was funny. Now, all of these legislation changes, rules, it, it builds – when I say a war on education, it's been ongoing for quite some time. And a lot of people will hear that and you'll roll your eyes. I get it, right? You'll say, well, look at all the free stuff you get. You get you know, you know, get your free coffee at McDonald's and you have teacher appreciation week and the students bring you gifts and everyone always says that teachers are underpaid and underappreciated i totally get that and the vast majority of people feel that way however it's still a profession that i feel like you're either one way or the other there aren't a lot of people that are like yeah teachers are you know pretty adequately paid and you know, ready to go. Everyone has an opinion on the teaching profession, whether they are teachers or not. And it becomes frustrating, especially on things like social media. I will say that the majority of my social media that I see, and I, I don't teach in the same county that I live in. I live in a much more um, rural county. It's very red traditionally. And the undermining and mistreatment of teachers on social media and just schools in general is shocking a lot of the time you you see a huge movement where people say oh teachers are underappreciated but those same people will go through and say public school is terrible you should homeschool if you have the option or hey try a charter school try a private school if you can afford those things those things are also undermining the teaching professional especially the the homeschooling right to say, oh, the school system is terrible, it sucks, that's saying that the teaching sucks, right? And it, it just kind of blows my mind that people say, no, I, I'm 100% in support of teachers. It's like, are you? Because I also saw your Facebook post during the COVID year saying, since my kid's at home during teaching and just learning through a Zoom class, that means I don't have to pay my taxes this year for education, right? Ha, ha, ha. Can I get that money back? That's blatantly saying stop paying the teachers since they're doing since they're teaching from home and the students are learning from home. Right? We can't have it both ways. It's those little remarks that are constantly digging at the teachers. And a lot of it is because we have to teach to all children, right? We want to teach to all children. The issue is that by teaching to all children, that's commonly seen as pandering to the quote unquote left I'm doing the little air quotes, right? So we see this, we see this dynamic of the teachers saying, 
hey, I want everyone to, if I were to say the following statements, does our mind naturally go to always pandering to left, right? I want all students, regardless of race, gender, sexuality, um, it, anything, right? I want to teach to all students and I want all students to have equal opportunities. There are a lot of people out there, people within my own family, even, that if they heard me say that, they would say, oh, why don't you just go on CNN with your propaganda? Whereas with me, I, I mean that exactly how I say it. Every student, right? I, I think that we forget that we've been catering to a certain a certain way for a lot of years. Even when, if you are in your forties, fifties, older, you we're doing the same stuff at the beginning every day. At the beginning of every single day, we are required to say the pledge of allegiance and have a one minute moment of silence so that students can pray if they so choose. That's the reason the rule is instituted every single day. We say under God every single day. Right. And the students are required to stand. They don't necessarily have to speak it, but that is something that we do every day. And I think that we forget how enshrined the, the common Christian values are within school. And we, we hear the separation of church and state all the time, but there really isn't a separation of church and state. We look at, um, within, once again, within my County, we have the, uh, what, what's it called? The moms of Liberty. They're a huge, huge group here in Florida. If you have not heard anything about the Moms of Liberty and what they're going through and doing, kind of what they stand for, and maybe you stand for the same things, and that's fine. Um, it, it it's a it's a huge movement right now, taking school stores away and um, banning certain books. Basically, any book right now that has any any sort of um, same sex parents, um. The big thing is the history, what do they call it? A critical race theory, as they're calling it, which basically means if we are teaching about slavery in the United States and we say anything that could make that could that could uh, instill white guilt, that we need to get that book taken away. We need to take that out of the curriculum. So there, there's a lot of things going in, and, and Florida is a very overwhelmingly red state recently because um, Governor, De Governor uh, DeSantis is is very, very popular here for sure. I know that a lot of people around the country think that he is going to be the next president and he very, way, he very well may be, which would be interesting because we've uh, been under his tutelage for a little while. So I just think that we have to remember that just because teachers and schools are trying to make sure that we give everyone equal treatment does not mean that we are giving unequal treatment to people that have had preferential treatment in the past. I know that most schools that I've seen, if you were to look up their, um, the, the amount of referrals that they write, a lot of schools give referrals and hand harsher punishments to um, male students of color way higher in proportion than they do anybody else. If you were to take that demographic. And so it's, we have to take a step back and we have to say, why is that? Is it because we are seeing male students of color in a certain light? Or is it because they really are doing these things at a, at a disproportionate rate? And if, if they are, then is there something that we can do to help those students? Because there's no reason why we should see any sort of outlier like that at, at some sort of extreme. So a, co a couple things here from a uh, student and parent perspective. First, students, when it comes to rules and things that we ask you to do, understand that we don't hold as much power over the rules as you think we do. That's something that I've been talking to my my kids about with the with the cell phone rule. 
you know, they're, they're upset about the cell phone rule. There's a petition going around for the school to let, let them use their phones. And, and I keep telling them, I say, listen, this is not a school rule. It's not a, you know, I say, this is not a, my classroom rule. This is not a school rule. This is not a county rule. It's a state law. It's not even a rule. This is something where our teaching certificates are on the line. If we don't follow these things. So if someone from the county were to just come into my room and I was giving you a break and every student was allowed to just be on their phone, if they wanted to strip my teaching certificate, they absolutely could. And I I have no backup plan. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life, potentially. So there are some things that I I, I cannot and will not fight. And we can't even protest for some of the things that we believe in. A lot of people don't realize, at least in the state of Florida, if we miss work in protest, like if we if we choose to protest, then we will we are supposed to automatically get our license rescinded, our teaching certificate. I know that there have been a couple of cases since I've been teaching where students have orchestrated a lockout or not a lockout, a, a walkout like after the Pulse shooting, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, they want the students wanted to do um, a moment of silence. I think it was um, one second of silence for all of the victims in the courtyard, and that was something where we as teachers, um, a, a, a couple other instances, the Stoneman Douglas shooting that happened, which is once again in Florida. And we could very well see one in cell phone. If the students walk out of our classrooms, we are not allowed to participate with you. The only way that teachers and admin staff in general can join you in that, quote unquote, is if we are just sitting out there supervising to make sure that nobody is is getting hurt. I know that a, a wonderful coworker of mine, his name's Mark, he... Not at my school, but at another school, another fellow chorus teacher. He, um, during the pulse shooting, or not during the pulse shooting, but after the pulse shooting, when the students had the walkout, he walked right out there with them, and that's what he did. He, you know, he was pretty much joining them, and but but he said, "Hey, I'm going to go out there just to make sure that you guys are safe and that there's nothing going on." He didn't want to make sure there was an attack on those students that were trying to prove a point. So parents, please accept that teachers aren't out to get you or your children. I, I know that you might say, you might be like, well, obviously, right? And I, I'm sure that a few may have a vendetta. I, I know that there are teachers that might say, oh, I had so-and-so's older brother or older sister. I know how you're going to be. And then maybe they're treating that student a certain way. But the vast majority love what – what they do and just want to be there to help guide your student. I mean, Lord knows we don't do it for the money. Right. And so sorry to get to stay hydrated here. <laughs> and so uh, it's, it's the same thing we talk about, like the police brutality, right. Um, when that whole movement was going on, I, I think with teachers, it's the same way. If there are teachers doing a bad job and are intentionally, ruining the education for specific students. I think that they need to be held accountable and we as teachers will hold them accountable. It's like when I have people ask, Oh, what, what do you think about that teacher two counties over that, uh, got caught, you know, sleeping with a student and be like, what do you mean? What do I think? I think they should go to prison forever. I think that's terrible. I'm not going to try to defend that person just because they're also a teacher. No, they're not a teacher anymore anyway, right? I'm not defending them. And I think we need to hold those teachers accountable, but don't just assume that they're going after your kid. I, there's a there's a teacher at my school, a math teacher. He's an older gentleman and he's been at the school for a long time and his students at the beginning of the year do not like him. They think that he's mean. They think that he gives way too much homework. He sends too many emails home to make sure that they're doing their work and he's on them all the time. By the end of the year, most of those students are so sad to, to leave his classroom 
and go to high school. He teaches an eighth grade class because they know that he was on them the whole year out of love. He refuses to let those students fail. If they need extra help, he's going to give them all the extra help that they need. If he needs to call home and tell their parents, hey, I have these websites. I would love if you would make them go on and just do 15 minutes a day extra work to help get caught up. The students don't like it, but having someone that cares that much to refuse to let you fail goes a long way. And then the last thing that I have for for parents or students, I guess, get to know a teacher personally and ask about the ins and outs of daily teaching life. And you might even be able to help think of ways to fix things that you have a problem with because we as teachers and administrators and everyone, we do kind of live in our own little bubble. And I know that for me, it's just go, go, go. It's not just there in the class. I My job cannot be just show up, teach, go home. I can't do that. For a lot of the students, it's show up, learn, go home. But also there's all those social things going on in and out of the classroom, all the planning that goes into it. And if you know a teacher personally, I, I've never met a teacher that has never done work outside of the classroom, right? Outside of contract hours. And a lot of times teachers are are planning and prepping throughout the entire summer to make sure that they know what's going on. So I would say just get to know one personally and, and really ask them, you know, take, take a little bit of a stake in their lives. Remember that teachers are people too. It's so easy to mistreat teachers because we naturally feel like teachers mistreat children, which is, is such a shame because I know that the vast majority of my students, probably 99% of the students that go through my program enjoy my program and wish that they could be part of my program for even longer. And I wish they could be in my program for even longer, right? I want to build lifelong learners and good people. And so, I don't know. Like I said, if you if you just ask them, you know, hey, what are the what are your major difficulties? And it's possible that maybe you have a job. Maybe you're an accountant and you are super, super good at time management and organization. I know a lot of teachers that are not good at time management and organization. You think about staying there. We talked about this plan, pre-planning, right? Staying at the school till 10 p.m. every single night planning when you could probably just work more efficiently during your plan time and – and get the same amount of stuff done. Maybe you as a parent can give them strategies to help them, even though you're, you might not be a teacher and you might not be lesson planning for physics class the next day. You still might be able to lend a helping hand and, and just kind of treat everything with grace. And remember that the, the things that you say on social media and to teachers and to people that know teachers, because I think most people do know someone that's been in the teaching profession, make, make sure that you're just careful with what you say. Because like I said, all it takes, when I see family members posting things saying, oh, you know, I, I can't wait till they're out of high school. The, the teachers, the teachers there are terrible and, you know, they learn nothing, right? That's the big thing that the only thing they learn in school is to be miserable, very, you know, the insert your own rendition of, of that tweet and Facebook post and things. And to me, I mean, I do take that personally because I work my tail off to give my students a, the, the best education that they can, the best experience that they can. So I'll, that's all it takes to kind of burn that bridge. So anyway, that'll do for today's episode I'm not sure if next week is going to be our episode on relationships, friendships, um, but we'll see. Not going to try to miss another one again. I'm hoping everything, uh, hoping everything uploads correctly this week because I was sad that I didn't. I've been so on it. Been, I've been pretty good. So anyway, have a good one. <laughs>